Hey guys, this is Jan for Chess24 and this is an opening clinic special edition Thailand Open Bangkok Chess Club Open. I just got back from Bangkok where I participated in my annual tournament, the Bangkok Chess Club Open. And I am here with resuming our more or less annual tradition. I'm not sure if I've been doing it every year, but normally I've been doing this little, little video where I tell you guys how my tournament went, how the openings went mainly. It's an opening clinic special, what I prepared, what I didn't prepare, where I was surprised, where things went well, where things went wrong, that kind of stuff. So hopefully this will be a look behind the scenes into a Grandmaster's kitchen, clinic kitchen, kitchen clinic. We shall find out. I got back yesterday night. I'm still a little jet lag, therefore you will forgive me if I'm rambling more than usual. It's like 6 p.m. here now, which I guess in Thailand is around midnight. And if you know me, you will take my word that I was soundly asleep at midnight every single night in Bangkok. Anyway, let's get into the action. It was an open tournament, which typically means that in the first round, you are a favorite. I was the number two seed after some expertly timed rating losses in Bundesliga right before the tournament. Nigel Short was the number one seed and there were no other 2600s in the field, but a lot of strong, hungry grandmasters, a lot of guys from India. So tricky tournament, but in the first round, I faced an opponent with 18, 32, I believe, at the black pieces. Typically in the first round, you don't prepare in such events. And that's not so much out of arrogance because you think the extra, whatever it is, 800 points will probably do the job, but also because the pairings tend to come out pretty late. I think this round was played at 3 p.m. and the pairings were published at, don't get me wrong, but probably not before two. So usually there's no real time to prepare. And it's more or less over the board inspiration. What do you do? I recall that I think it was last year when I played, I went E4 G6 in my first round game and it didn't go very well. So I thought in this one, back to basics, I'll just do my usual stuff, play E4, E5, and try to keep enough pieces on the board to make the game somewhat interesting. So we played some theory, this is Marshall Mainline stuff, rook e1, b5, bishop b3, short castles. He played h3, which is quite a sophisticated move for, yeah, to encounter in the first round. I was a bit surprised. The mainline, or the martial mainline is c3, d5, a4, another option. The point of h3 is that d5 directly is not so good now, because I think you can take the pawn. And if black plays d6, then why play c3 and we transpose to mainline Spanish without having allowed the c3 d5 marshal. So what black typically does is you play bishop b7, the waiting move, not committing to d6 or d5 just yet. And here what white should do is play d3, create this wall against the bishop on b7. And now black has a choice between d5 with sharp play or d6 with more quiet play. I think I would have played d6 under the circumstances just to avoid forcing stuff and keep more pieces on the board when my favorite plan is queen d7, knight d8, knight d6, c5. Take it from there. I think it's quite playable. So is d3, d5. My opponent in this position, I guess, mixed up lines a little bit. He played c3 here, which looks natural, but since I haven't committed my d pawn to d6 yet, in this position d5 is good. Here was already dreaming of a quick victory after e d knight d5. Knight takes e5, knight takes e5, rook takes e5, and knight f4, where we see the down side of playing c3. This square is very vulnerable. This pawn is hanging. This is a line, I think I've had this in a couple blitz games. There's more or less a forced win for black. So for example, this queen g4, knight here, threatening a little check, knight d2, and now. I think a5 is good, intending to swing this rook over. 
So it didn't happen. I had to work a little harder at my opponent. Did not take this pawn. Instead he played pawn to d4. E takes d. Knight takes d4. Knight takes d4. C takes d. And my position was quite pleasant, but no immediate victory was apparent. There is a couple of ways here. Bishop f6 was fine. What I did, I think, was also fine. Takes, and I went pawn to b4, trying to restrict this knight. The black is a little better. Not exactly winning yet, but it was enough to pose problems and bring the point home. Nothing I want to brag about all that much, because I was 800 points high rated. And again, I'll still brag a little bit. Look at this b4 move, restricting the knight. Yay me. Anyway, first round, business as usual. My opponent, I'm not sure how old he was, 13, 14, so you're always a little scared dealing with unknown young people. But that one worked. And in the second round, I would play another, what's the term, young person. I think women's candidate master, Vishna, Vishva Vasnavala, I'm sure I'm getting the names mispronounced, apologies for that. This time I had the white pieces and I prepared, I think a little bit, there weren't that many games to go on. So I went 1c4 for no particular reason. I played a bunch of c4s this tournament and I think only 1d4. One, one Generally, yeah, as usual with white, I alternate between 1 knight f3, 1d4 and 1c4 according to opponent and trying to move all of them out of some of their favorite openings. I think in this game I, th I saw a fair chance of getting a Marocci, which is indeed what, hap what happened. And generally if I feel I can get a Marocci with white, I'm very comfortable with that scenario. What I mean by Marocci is we played this line and here my opponent played pawn to g6. When I've said this in many videos and it's still my fairly strong belief that in this position it's not a question of style but it's just much stronger to play knight f6 followed by e6. So my advice to everybody out there is to do this even if you're normally a King's Indian player or Dragon player or whatever a Grunfeld player and you really like to fianchetto your bishop, this, in my opinion, is not the position to do it. And I believe this is a leak that many, many people have, at the very least up to 2500, maybe even above that, because it's much easier to build a repertoire around, I play g6, bishop g7, around the accelerated dragon, Marocci, and then around knight f6, e6, People tend to do that, but overall, I think it just makes black's life harder. Not claiming that white has a forced win here, or that this is an unplayable opening. But overall, from what I've seen, it's not a line I like with black. And I'm very surprised so many people have it in the repertoire. And if I can smell a way to move order my opponent into it, I will very often very strongly consider it. So I went e4 here. It's very important not to start with knight c3, because then after bishop g7, let's say knight c2, black has this option of taking here, which is very, very different. And this is a messy position that you don't want with white. Instead, e4 played bishop to g7. And here, small confession, I do think the objectively best move is bishop to e3, which transposes to Marocci main lines. After this, you go f3, or bishop e2, and I think, after my little rant, you probably guessed that, that white has pretty good chances to get an advantage here. However, I do like the setup with a knight on c2, so I went for it here, but I don't think this is the best version. I think the best version is in, let's say, this position, where the black knight is already committed to f6. The difference is that here, after bishop g7, knight c2, black has some extra options. One of them is queen to b6, which didn't happen in the game, but it's interesting, targeting this pawn. And after knight c3, once again, trying to reach this structure. It's a little brazen because the queen on b6 is misplaced for that structure. 
so I would have been okay with that, but it's still a radical attempt to change the nature of the game. And the other one I think more interesting is after d6, as played in the game, I play bishop e2, still delaying knight c3 until knight f6 happens, so the bishop can't capture. But here I believe that instead of knight f6, Black should try the move knight to h6, preparing f5. I believe this is the main difference and the reason why knight c2 is not that great in this move order. I used to think this was bad for black because of g4, but when I was studying that game, or I think I, I saw it before, I'm not sure, but I think I probably saw it after I played this game, when I entered this knight h6 g4, and the computer said that knight g8 was a good move here, which I wasn't aware of. I used to look at some lines like this, which are better for white, but this knight h6, g4, knight to g8 makes a lot of sense. Now oh, the knight just goes to f6 and the white king is no longer so safe. This could be a very interesting way to play. Of course, white doesn't have to play g4, but if you play slowly here, then this idea to play f5 and recapture with the knight, control some squares, looks fairly reasonable for black. So I think there's an interesting alternative. In the game we got the main line of this complex, knight f6, knight c3, castles, castles, knight to d7. Most people on the internet play bishop e6 here, but in theory knight d7 has always been the main move. And it happened again, knight d7, as you might have guessed from my previous mentions of the topic, I don't like to allow bishop c3, bc3, even though bishop e3 is an interesting move here. But I went bishop to d2, knight c5, my opponent was still blitzing here, so I was fairly certain she was prepared for this <clears throat> position to occur on the board. In the past I had played a couple games with pawn to b4 here, but I didn't want to follow my own games and risk to run into too much prep. After pawn to b4, what I think is critical is to grab the pawn, takes, takes, knight takes e4, bishop b2. As a very young man, more than 20 years ago, I lost a very painful game to Luke van Vele here, where I played bishop e6 at that time, following my old accelerated dragon book, and after b5, knight e5, queen d4, I realized it might be time to resign, because after knight f6, f4, knight d7, g4, why is just winning? So that's a lesson that stuck in my mind, but unfortunately, Nowadays, instead of bishop to e6, people will play the move e5, restricting this bishop, and it isn't so clear. White has fair compensation for the pawn, like bishop d3, knight f6, queen to d2, and probably given a choice, I'd still take white. But I did not feel like going for it in this game, and I also knew that f3, just defending this pawn, is a very serviceable alternative here in this position. So I played pawn to f3, and yeah, my opponent kept playing quite quickly. Played a5, stopping b4, all logical moves. But after bishop e3, bishop e6, queen d2, a4 was played. We get sort of a typical position for these lines. I went knight a3, just defending this pawn and keeping an eye on the b5 square, queen a5, rook fd1, rook fc8, rook ac1. And here, as it often happens in the Marochi, especially if there's these four pairs of minor pieces on the board, once both sides have finished their setup, queen to a5, rook fc8, and so on and so forth, and there are no apparent tar targets in the white camp, then black is just much worse, because white has all the long-term plans, and black really doesn't. White always has the key to this knight d5, which can be a nuisance at any point. You don't have to do it quickly, but normally making black take it and then recapturing in whatever way is the most favorable. Why you can also, under many circumstances, think about creating play on the king side, be it by h4, h5, by f4, f5. <clears throat> and white can just keep improving his position, what I did in the game, pointing out that the black pieces are already at max capacity if they're not attacking anything, that things will be unpleasant. You might ask, why doesn't black go for counterplay with f5? 
That's sort of what you're waiting for here, because f5 just weakens the black king so much after ef, let's say bishop f5, knight ab5. Black doesn't really create any threats. The white position is so much easier to play here. Bishop f1, bishop h6, rook e1, knight t5 still looming. It's just good for white. This is one. Is this the position? I'm not sure. Sometimes after knight b4, it looks like this could be a threat. In some positions, even rook back to a1 was a good move. I'm not sure this is the position. That's one thing I remembered about these lines, that sometimes you should just put the rook here. No, it can't be here, because if knight c2... Anyway, probably just g4 here. Why is much better. So, end of anti marochi rent. My point is these positions, if black doesn't manage to pose problems quickly and <coughs> both sides stabilize, are nice for white. My opponent played h5, bishop f1, king h7, king h1. Maybe not the most critical moves, but as mentioned, I think that black doesn't really have many constructive plans here. And bishop f1 followed by king h1. Struck me as useful little moves. b4 was played a3, just hinting at maybe playing g4. Of course, a bit double-edged h3 because it weakens the dark squares. But I thought keeping the options of g4 in some lines open. <clears throat> and I had some other point, which I forgot by now. Made some sense. I think probably in reaction to f5. I might want to take and play g4. Anyway, bishop f6 was played, queen to f2, and bishop g7 back. Probably not the best, but sort of indicating that my opponent also struggled to find a plan here. And now after knight a b5, the white pieces are ready for action. A3 kicking this guy away is an option, bishop g5 is an option, f4, f5 could be an option. While for black it's very hard to do anything. My opponent played a3 and after b takes a. White sort of, yeah. Yes, complete control and an extra pawn for now. So yeah, once again I'm not trying to brag about beating somebody 600 points low rated. I'm mainly trying to show the strategic dangers of these Marochi positions, if all the pieces stay on the board and both sides stabilize. I think it's, yeah, it can be a useful point-making machine for you guys if you study it a bit with white. And I don't necessarily mean this stuff move by move, but more or less these Marochi structures in general. And I think it's a bit overrated or taught way too much from the black side, because it's not so hard to learn, but it's just a strategically very, very risky setup, this Marochi setup. And there is no coincidence, it's no coincidence that at the highest level, if you see this position, you will get the move e6. I don't know, 10 times more than g6. Um, so yeah, that's my repertoire recommendation for black players, this g6 Marochi stuff. I don't trust, and I was, well, I wasn't too thrilled to win that game, but Still happy to do so. Anyway, the going would get tougher, two out of two. And in third round, I faced an international master with a not so high rating, 2253 from India. <clears throat> I should not lie about his age. I guess he was a little older than me, maybe in his early 50s, somewhere in that neighborhood. And he went on to completely outplay me, which I had not expected. Anyway, let's look at the opening. c4, I went g6, knight c3, c5. And note that I'm not opting for a Marochi here after my rent, which I just gave. The difference is I have three bishop g7, d4, takes, takes, knight to c6. Why is not quite in time to get all this knight c2, bishop d2, e4 stuff. If knight c2 here, I was gonna take, take, knight to f6. So this g6, Knight c3, c5 is actually a fairly common move order to restrict white's options because the only good thing that white has here is to go for this symmetrical English, which we would see in the game, which is not everybody's cup of tea with this g6. Of course, assuming white plays knight c3, c5, you rule out quite some options for white. So. I'm I'm wondering, I should talk about my preparation. How well prepared was I for this game? 
I think I expected this line to be played and here my opponent, he had some games where he played d4, which I was hoping for, hoping to happen. But after g3, knight c6, bishop g2, I remember I spent some time struggling to decide which system to play here after d6 short castles, because normally I play the move bishop f5, I had some games with that, but then I wanted to surprise him, so I wasn't sure if I should do that. I was wondering about e5, which I think is a good move, but the structure is a little dry for my taste and I thought it might make life a bit too easy to play all these, whatever. Typical maneuvers, knight to e3, even though I do think that e5 is a very, very reasonable move. And in the end, I went for the move e7 to e6, which is Peter Svidler's favorite. He played it, for example, against Magnus Carlsen in one of the world well, thing is the world blitz, the world rapid, I think the world blitz. And it's just a flexible move. You want to go knight e7, short castles, and then have a look around. My opponent played the critical line e3, knight g7, d4, short castles. And here, one point of this line is supposed to be that white can't really play b3, which is what he did, and which also looks like the most logical move. You just want to develop the bishop and reinforce the center. But you can ask some tactical questions there. Magnus played rook e1, which I guess is a better move. So is rook to b1. Just, you know, some subtle, slightly improving the position moves without committing to things yet. <clears throat> so b3 was played, and here I kind of knew it wasn't very good, but I hadn't given it much attention in my preparation. I knew that both e5 directly and what I did knight to f5 knight to e2 and now e5 were supposed to be fine for black and this was sort of the extent of my knowledge which really is enough knowledge for pretty much every purpose but of course over the board if this happens you always kick yourself a little bit and think ugh I should have looked in some more detail so this happened knight e2 e5 takes takes when yeah black is trying to play actively trying to use this loose rook over here and some tricks like bishop b2 doesn't work because of e4 and we take all the pieces to put some pressure on white of course black is making a bit of a strategic concession giving up these light squares in the center and my opponent yeah he was not too scared by my bravado with e5 Took can play knight g5, sensible move, preparing bishop t5 or knight e4 or just knight c3. Knight f7, also sensible move, reinforcing this guy so I can play b6, maybe preparing e4, f5. Bishop a3, b6, rook a d1. So far, yeah, pretty sensible play from both players. I went bishop g4, which I also thought was good. No, you could make a case for not provoking f3, just playing bishop d7. But I went bishop g4, f3, bishop f5, and here for some reason I was convinced he should play the move e4, when I thought it was a bit better after bishop d7. And then when he played knight to c3, which is a much better move, I started questioning life and the choices I had made to get here, and all that kind of stuff, which is normally not an ideal mindset to have during a chess game. And I started playing very badly somewhere around here. The position is still fine, but you need to play precisely with black, because if white gets everything he wants, you can end up being worse, which is exactly what happened. What I should have done, I think, is bishop d3, which was my first candidate, but after rook f1, e h6, knight e4, I only thought about f5, which is bad, after knight f2, and then somehow I abandoned the line, even though here we play knight to b4, as my computer friend points out. And black is in very good shape. But I moved, missed that move and therefore didn't go for this line and played, frankly, fairly terrible. I went h6, bishop here, preparing f5, but knight b5. As I had seen the problem, well, not the problem, but I'm sure you guys know this. Sometimes you play badly, you see every one of your opponent's moves, but there's still not much you can do about it. You still go for it. So I went for this very unpleasant position. My opponent kept playing strong moves. G4, good move. 
you're fighting against f5 because now you can take and play bishop h3 and i got outplayed fairly systematically for a long time then the good news is that in time trouble the old flagging trickster instincts did come to my help i was still in trouble somewhere around here after b5 i think computer says bishop b2 gives white a big advantage but we were both low on time and finally my humble 400 point rating advantage helped my opponent to give me that rook and as we know i'm good taking rooks after knight e2, bishop d8, turns out this rook has no square. Because after rook a7, knight c6, it's getting picked up. So that was, yeah, I'm not sure of a wake up call. It was more of a thing I sort of know about myself that sometimes in these English slow positions with black, especially if I'm not careful, I can get outplayed. And it shouldn't happen, of course, if you're such a rating favorite, but it can happen. And kudos to my opponent who played a very, very strong game, which had, in my opinion, absolutely nothing to do with his rating. And I got very fortunate that I managed to swindle him in time trouble. Could easily have gone badly. But yeah, theoretically, not much to say. I was reasonably well prepared. With hindsight, I should have looked some more at these types of positions. But b3 is not the way. And with black, it's hard to check every sideline till the very end. So, not blaming myself too much, but didn't go too well. Then, next round, I would get the white pieces more comfortable with the white pieces against German Grandmaster Gerhard Schiebler. Mm, by the way, why can't we see the engine bar properly? Let's take you. <clears throat> hmm? Still looks a bit weird. I'll fix it. Tech Young, back in business. Hmm. So I was white against Gerhard Schiebler in round number four. Schiebler lives in Thailand and I hope I'm not telling any tales out of school here. He was commuting to the tournament from where he resides to Bangkok, which is I think like a three and a half our trip every morning or especially that day because this round started at 11 a.m and not only the rounds were starting at 2 p.m but two rounds i think which ones were at four and five maybe started at 11 a.m which even though i've complained about a lot my results have been okay there spoiler alert and i personally don't like preparing in the night usually if the the round start at 2 p.m then i will prepare in the morning and sometimes i'm stubborn with these 11 a.m rounds i decide to choose <clears throat> i decide to choose to prepare in the morning as well which is what happened in this game against Schäbler. so i did not do all that much preparation but i did get up early i set my alarm at whatever eight ish Went to breakfast and then prepared from 9 till 10.45, somewhere in that neighborhood. And yeah, I noticed he played two openings. One of them was the King's Indian, where he played some sort of goofy sidelines I had planned there. And the other seemed to be the Bogo Indian. And if someone plays the Bogo Indian, I'm normally game and will not mess around with the move or not like play 1c4 or 1 knight f3 or whatever because if people want to play the bogo i feel you should let them like if i see his repertoire is whatever line after d5 one of the main lines here sometimes even the queen's indian then i will think about move ordering with 1c4 or 1 knight f3 but the bogo i think should be encouraged and it should be said this happened in the game but my opponent because of his commute was like 38 minutes late he had an hour tolerance so it was perfectly fine but it always puts you in this weird spot mentally like the game was at 11 a.m and i was wondering do i want him to show up or do i just want to claim the win without a fight go light the pool it's a weird feeling then when he arrives after all that time 
But I guess mathematically, with the white pieces and an extra 38 minutes, I should want people to show up because, of course, it's a favorable situation. So Schäbler showed up, played this, knight bd2, and he played b6, which I also told him this after the game. I think if you're a Bogo player, then in this position, you have to bite the bullet, is that an expression, and play these sharp lines. Well, likewise, chances I just had a game in Bundesliga, and I had looked at these lines very, very recently. I think they're very dangerous for black, but I still think that if black plays this position, that's what he should do. Because these positions that we would get in the game are just so thankless after b6, a3, takes, queen takes. Queen takes might look strange, but it's a better move than bishop takes. The bishop can be fianchettoed here. And this, yeah, for me, as a lover of the bishop pair, but also as a bit of an aficionado of the queen c2 nemzo, this is just such a dream situation to have after five moves. Because if you compare it with the nemzo Indian, for example, Nimzo is knight to c3, bishop b4. One of the main moves here is queen to c2. And let's say castles. a3 takes, queen takes. You might notice that the queen needed two moves to claim the bishop pair here and get to the c3 square. While well, the bogo only needs one move, just needs to go to d2. So it's clearly a much better version than the queen's Indian. Than, sorry, the Nimzo Indian. Even if black plays b6 here, whatever. Which, nowadays people don't do, this is still considered nice for white. But if the queen can grab that bishop, just moving once, I think it's just not a great line for black. Anyway, that game would go reasonably smoothly from my perspective. There's not so much to say, theoretically. I've had this position a couple times in the past. Thinly veiled brag coming. I won this position against Fabiano Caruana in the European Team Championship 2007. I'm not going to mention how old Caruana was then, you guys figure that out, but I'm saying I had experience here. Mm. The one line that I think theoretically you have to know if you want to play this with white is this attempt by black to go for a quick attack, knight e4, f5, intending rook f6, rook g6 or rook h6. And as far as I know, both bishop to b2 and the immediate d5 favor white. d5, e5, knight d2, for example, I think is supposed to be better for white. And funnily, I would get a very similar position with colors reversed the next day. Anyway, we'll get to that. I think, yeah, if you want to study this for white, with black, as mentioned, I think you shouldn't play it. You want to study with white, this is the one line. You need to know a bit about how to react to ED, how to react to E5. Not here. Computer will yell white is better. Well, if black plays slowly here, as it happened in the game, there's not so much to know. You put the pieces and you hope for the best. Typically, knight somewhere followed by F3 to cripple these pieces. Is always a part of the plan. And yeah, that game, I don't want to spend too much time on it. went reasonably smoothly. White just has the two bishops and a space advantage here. And it's a very tough, <coughs> unpleasant defense for black. I'm not claiming the position is winning, I don't know. But white will win this quite a bit. It's by no means an easily defendable position. So yeah, I would not advise going for this. And in the game, of course, helped by the fact that my opponent was a bit late in the game, so he started with a serious time disadvantage. We get something like this, where, yeah, you can see I grabbed quite a bit of space and have the two bishops. And Schäbler lost some time here while he was trying to execute the move bishop to c8. The position is winning. I would still have had to show some technique. It's not winning by just playing moves. But overall, with a space advantage and all these weaknesses, I don't think black can defend. And the computer comes up with some direct wins here, actually. Some d5, king c7, f4. If I would have done that in mutual time trouble, I don't know. I might have stuck to some more shuffling around. Even though at some point here, yeah, I think my position was more or less 
fully optimized. So you have to do something. D5 was very high on my list of candidates. So yeah, that was a pleasant game against Schibler, who made life a bit easier, in my opinion, with his opening choice. This bishop b4 check followed by b6. It's just not a great line. Then in the next round, as it often happens, I would have the black pieces again. Oh, I should show you guys some pictures, by the way. I have some pictures. Um, let's see what's here. Not that many pictures. This is round number three in the game where I got outplayed by this gentleman and then swindled him. And in round number five, I would face, I think my, hmm, don't let me lie, fourth Indian opponent. Opponents in rounds number one and two were Indian, number three, then number four, Mr. Schäbler was German. And round number five, this is Mr. Kartik Venkataraman, um, a Grandmaster Rite 2505, who had played some good chess. And he went for the move one knight to f3. I played d5, and he played b3. He was one of these cases where I saw that he played more or less everything with white. He played d4 main lines, e4 main lines c4, knight f3, g3, knight f3, e3, knight f3, b3, where typically I choose not to prepare very much. Or sometimes you repeat one line. I honestly can't remember which line it was that I repeated before the game against him. It certainly wasn't knight f3, d5, b3. But then you tell yourself, okay, I can't pre prepare seven different openings. So you just try to get some rest and go into the game fresh. F3, D5, B3 seem to indicate that he was also fine playing chess without too much theory. And here you can do all kinds of things in the past. I've played Bishop G4, which I think is a pretty decent move as well. And in this game I decided to be more quote-unquote classical. Play C5 and treat this like a whatever you want to call it. Queen's Indian with colors reversed, Knight F6, Knight C6. Bishop b5 is a critical move, trying to, you know, clamp down on this e5 square. But as you guys know, I like bishops. And after bishop b5, bishop d7, he more or less promised to give me his bishop here. So not too unhappy about that. I think in the next couple moves, white should just throw this in ASAP, asking me to commit to rook c8 or queen c7. I would have played rook c8, then e6, bishop somewhere, and have a look around. But I think Kartik was slightly imprecise with the move order because he waited a bit. He went castles, e6, d3, bishop e7, knight bd2 first. And now after castles, now he took knight e5. But here, since the e8 square is already available, I no longer need to play rook to c8. Bishop e8. And as a bishop fanatic, I was very, very pleased with my position here already which maybe was overrating things a little bit. I still think this is a very good outcome of the opening for, for black. There was no theory involved, because yeah, I don't think there is much theory to know. I did recall that um, I had once looked at, I don't even recall where my bishop is going here. I think here at some position like this. And I thought it was fine for black, but this is the extent of my knowledge. So I thought without the rook on c8, things should be even better. And after f4, I decided to get ambitious push with d4 in the center, which the computer is not such a big fan of, even though I think it's a very reasonable decision. It was also a very reasonable to decision to just keep the structure, play knight d7, followed by f6, when once again, I would take black with the two bishops, but that might be a matter of taste. The game d4 was played, e4, and now knight d7. 
knight e f3 black back. I was very confident here with my space advantage and my bishops, but I started, at least during the game, I thought, producing some very weird moves. I'm not sure if they're objectively bad, but I was very unhappy with myself. So I thought, which makes sense, this knight on d7 is stupid, should be improved. I should go knight b8, followed by knight to c6. Then I started thinking about it and I thought, ah, knight b8, b4 bothers me a little bit. C, B, I don't know. Knight takes D4. The position is not so clear. So, so far, reasonable assumption, even though the computer says Knight B8, B4 is just better for black. But that reasoning brought me to, I'll play Rook C8, then he can never play B4, because C2 will be weak. Which is already somewhat odd thinking. So he played A4, and now I blitzed out Knight B8 for no real reason. Like, normally I don't do this to blitz out moves and then start thinking, but sometimes it happens. And it's usually a bad move or a move I'm unhappy about. Like, the computer says it's a good move, but I was very unhappy with my knight b8 move here. And I was kicking myself for not playing f6 first, keeping the tension and getting ready to maybe meet b4 with e5 before I commit to anything. So, I played knight b8, he played b4. And... I was unhappy. I often have this self-loathing thing in positions that are objectively fine. And probably this is one of those where there's no reason to panic yet. The computer said, if you can see by this little bar, the black is better. But I had the feeling I had messed up and was not pleased with myself. Knight b3 I thought was a good move. I'm preparing knight c4 and then activity on the, um, which side is it? The king side. I played f6, which makes sense blocking this bishop, but I was fairly miserable here. For really no particular reason, because black is still doing fine objectively. So he played knight c4, I went bishop f7, full disclosure, offered a draw, which in hindsight, fortunately was turned down. Um, yeah, I just didn't like my position at all. The position is not so bad, but I really, really started freaking out after this knight b8, b4 thing, which shouldn't put me that um, on tilt, and I'm not quite sure why that happened. But sometimes, yeah, you get into your own head and all that. And here also, the computer still says black is fine, but I think there are reasons to not like this position. The computer says instead of bishop f7 to play e5 directly, which was my idea with bishop f7, but I didn't want to fully commit to it yet. Which once again shows some hesitation between, I don't like it, but I don't want to calculate yet. I was in a, drifting in a dangerous spot here. So frankly, I thought he would accept my draw offer and we'd be done with the game. But to his credit, he played queen g4 fairly quickly and made me sit there with my position again. I thought if I just play slowly here, b6 or whatever, Compi is saying that I might just get checkmated, some rook lifts here. And I didn't see any overly productive plan for myself. So that didn't seem like an option. And then I calculated one line and decided to go for it. That line, I actually calculated correctly, but I'll tell you what went wrong. The line was e5, which I played. Looks a bit desperate at first sight, giving a pawn, but it's actually a reasonable move. I don't think it's that desperate. The line I'd seen was f takes e, f takes e, knight takes e5, knight takes e5. This is what I calculated, not <laughs> what happened, even though something like this happened. King, king h1, queen g6, queen takes hg, and I thought black is fine. This is Somewhat similar to one of these mar martial positions where you go for an endgame and pawn down, but you do have the two bishops. And here I thought with this weakness here. Life should be pretty alright, and the computer confirms that, says it's equal. So that was okay. But now that I had seen this line, I should have calculated a little better how to execute it precisely. And it turns out that the proper way to do this was f takes e. Knight takes e5, and now queen b6 check. King h1 takes, takes, and queen g6. And the point is that this move order covers the d4 square. 
and doesn't allow white to put any piece there. Well, what I did is I went knight takes e5, knight takes e5, f takes e5, bishop e5, queen b6 check. Once again, expecting king h1, queen g6. But now, very late, I realized that knight d4 was very unpleasant. So I was sitting there kicking myself, wondering what I should be doing after knight to d4. The difference is that now after queen g6, first of all, he can keep queens very conveniently. And also he can take and after hg. This pawn is already covered, even though I think this position is still fine. The problem is that queen to e2, followed by knight f5. Looked unpleasant. So I was sitting there, not very happy with my prospects, trying to figure out what to do against this. Should I give the bishop? Nah, not really. Can't do it. Rook c5, queen h5 maybe. So I was calculating this. And while I was calculating, my opponent played the move rook to f2, which was a very nice gift. And I wasn't even surprised because I had calculated this rook f2 from very far away. And I had seen that it was just losing. I had thought about this when I was about e5 here. So that was nice. I wasn't surprised and I could not believe my luck and I accepted this gift. Because here, after queen takes f2, black just wins. King f2, bishop e6. He resigned after queen f2. He didn't play king f2. But the point is bishop e6 check hits the queen. And if it blocks this check, be it from f4 or f3, then I have another check. Rook c2. Man, okay, it doesn't matter where. <clears throat> black emerges with a lot of extra material. And yeah, king g3 takes takes does not really help so yeah that was a very pleasant surprise and a nice little gift and I was torn between being annoyed about my level of play and lack of precision and thinking this might actually be my year to win this tournament again because you need a little luck and I've already received two gifts in my games in round three and five so I might be in the running here and I also, it did put me on 5 out of 5, which I think was the sole lead, even though I'm not sure about that, but I think so. Next round I would play, who did I play next round? I think, let's look at my list of pictures here. <clears throat> um, yeah, Mr. I think sometimes his name is given as MRLB. Always confusing. I call him Grandmaster Lalith. I'm not sure what the proper way is, so please let me know. But a very strong Indian player, Grandmaster, and the number three seed in the tournament. So I did prepare properly for this game, but I did not manage to guess what line he would play at all. Mm -hmm. which is always upsetting but of course can happen so let's have a look at that game I went 1c4 I'm not quite sure what I was trying to avoid I think he was mainly well, my memory is becoming really bad mm -hmm. I think there were a bunch of Queens Indians in, in there and I was trying to move order him off those. I could be wrong. I think that was my reasoning for 1c4. And, and I had also seen a bunch of games with c5. When once again I want to go Marochi hunting. Like I don't think against such a strong player I would have gotten this g6 business. But I had some plan in in this position, which I will keep to myself, because it's a secret plan. And I think this was I prepared. But instead after c4 he went knight to f6, which is a move I like, because the point is, now if we go knight to c3, then black plays e5, and you have all these bishop to b4 options. Well, if we play e5 directly, then why does the extra, op extra option of playing to g3? which you don't have to do, and I think in the Caruana match, 
we saw Karana play c4, e5 and Carlsen going knight c3, knight f3 directly. But the reasoning to start with knight f6 and only after knight c3 go e5 always made sense to me. Well, after g3, black has his extra option to play c6, d5, which nowadays also has its own body of theory. But philosophically, it always seemed like a sound choice for black. To me, to block this pawn after c6. So after knight f6, I didn't want to play d4 because I wasn't prepared for his Queen's Indian Nimzo. I think that's what I was away, avoiding. Like um, knight c3, and now he went e5. I played g3. <clears throat> The most famous recent game in this line, of course, is this game. Carlsen Karana from the tie break in the World Championship match, where after bishop b4, e4 was played. And if I recall correctly, Mr. Lally had some games where he went c6, either here or after c4, e5, g3. So I was sort of half expecting, hoping for that. But he played the line that normally is the reason why I don't go 1c4. Don't tell future opponents. But if they play e5, knight f6, d5, I never know what to do with white. And I think it's a very sound way to play. Mm, so here, at the very least, I should mention one point that white is going for him in this move order, where I start with g3. In the match, we often saw knight f3, knight c6, g3, d5, takes, takes, bishop g2. And here, Karan didn't play knight to b6, but he played this new modern system, bishop to c5, castles, castles, d3, rook e8. I think recently we've seen Giri play d3, h6 as well. So in this move order, I had with the immediate g3, the knight is forced back to b6. And this is also the reason, I'm guessing, why Karana himself played bishop b4 and not d5 in this position. Still, knight b6, knight f3, knight c6, castles, bishop e7. This is a position that always feels decent for black to me. I can't claim I have much experience here, but it always looks like black setup is sound, to put it mildly. Why is a ton of choice, d3, a3, rook b1, and so on and so forth, but I never liked any of the lines too much. a3, castles, b4, should be 6 this is one of the main lines. I went for a reasonably direct idea that I had first seen, I think I was doing commentary on the European Club Cup, which was it 2017? European Team Championship, not Club Cup, sorry. And Boris Gelfand won a nice game against Romain Edouard and came to the studio to show his game and he played this idea B5 followed by E3. The main line instead of b5, e3 is d3, a5, b5, knight d4, but I never know what to do with white there. So I went for the direct stuff, b5, e3, takes, takes, knight to d5. There's other moves here, I think, that Gelfand game was rook to b8, d4, this is what I recalled, and was somewhat nicer for white. Knight d5, very logical. Here, knight to e2, keeping the pieces on the board, the knight on the board, and Dreaming of some d4 in some positions. He played queen d7. I was out of book here and did my usual thing of cursing myself that I should have anticipated this line and that I don't understand 1c4 positions and that black's position looks very healthy to me. You know, all these helpful positive thoughts. And then played a very weird move. I played rook to e1 here. When the position is sort of screaming for the move d2 to d4, but I was very scared of d4 bishop g4, which might have been a bit of an overreaction because if you calculate a bit here, the d5, the knight is under attack. I thought rook a d8, and I have all these weak light squares. But still, it would have been much better than what I did in the game, and the computer is not buying this for black at all. Just take, go queen c2, and enjoy your extra pawn. Still looks scarier than the 170 or whatever he says, but no question that white should do this. Instead, I played rook to e1, which the point was, you know, to protect the knight, and after bishop g4, I can go bishop g2, bishop h3, bishop h1, and I thought d4, e4 later, but it was still a bit too subtle. And now 
yeah, the engine said a6 was a good move. My opponent played rook a d8. After queen c2, bishop g g4, bishop g2. I kind of liked my position again because I had this d4 or e4 options. But overall, I shouldn't make this video five hours long. So let's speed up a bit. He went bishop h5, d4, bishop g6, e4, knight b6. I thought I had a good position here because I was occupying the center and all that. But it turns out that black has enough counterplay, especially with his control of the c4 square. And that didn't really manage to pose any problems. Bishop e3, bishop f7, threatening knight c4. And I could not see anything better than pawn to d5. After which we got a more or less four sequence. Bishop a3, rook a1, here, here, rook a8. I had seen all this, but there was some detail I had missed from afar. Not rook b7, queen c8. Um, but I think I want to go here. Takes, takes, queen b5. I might have missed queen a6 from afar. Rook b7, queen a6, trapping this guy. I was still thinking about this position for a bit. Actually, the computer says it was okay to play like knight to c3 here. If you let him think, it says equality. But in the end, I thought it has little upside. I should instead, well, more or less bail out. But after rook a8, rook a8, with black control in the a5, white is not better here at all. And the game ended in a draw quickly after. I had to cover this idiot. He played rook a3, offering a draw, and the best move I have is queen to c2 back. So, no reason to turn it down. And yeah, well, I can't complain too much after how I lucky I got in some of the previous games, but I was mildly disappointed that I didn't manage to put any pressure with the precious white piece. Anyway, five and a half out of six. Couldn't complain too much, I think. After that, I now shared the lead with Nigel. Was that it? Um, trying to remember, but yeah, I think now that was the the round before I played Nigel, who also had yeah five and a half out of six. He had drawn. A game early in round two, but then crushed his way back into the tournament. And to make things more awkward, that night before I played Nigel, we had this VIP dinner, which is a well, VIP sounds a bit strong, but we had this lovely dinner, which they always organize at the Banco Chess Club Open, and it's fantastic. Many course meal at a good restaurant this time it was in the very hotel in one of the restaurants there and i sat next to nigel well we both sort of knew that with five and a half out of six we might face each other it wasn't too awkward and i'm quite comfortable around nigel and i think it didn't bother him that much as well but it's still always somewhat weird if you know you're playing somebody the next day you're hanging out with then to make things weirder we had this photo session which you also have every year at the thailand open the next morning before playing each other and they decided to stage a preview a pre-match giving Nigel the white pieces he played f4 I went e5 e4 d5 so that was unlikely to be repeated in the real game and they poured some water over us for the picture but yeah long story short I was black against Mr. Short and I had to decide what to do didn't no actually no, I did prepare a fair bit for that game. I think I even broke my rule, or rule is strong, of not preparing in the night because they had the dinner in the hotel and it was over at like 10.30, but it was felt like it was too late to go out after that and I wasn't gonna go sleep at 10.30. So I think I prepared quite a bit that night. And then in the morning there wasn't so much time with the breakfast and then the photo session, but still the photo session was over at like 10, 30, 11. So there was quite some stuff I looked at. However, none of that stuff included the move one D4. The only other time I played Nigel was, I 
while back in 2011 there he played e4, which is still his main move. And for some reason, I'm not sure why my head fabricated that, but for some reason I thought it was likely he would go for knight f3 followed by g3. Even though he doesn't do it very often, but for some reason I thought that's what he's gonna do. Anyway, he didn't. He played one d4, which I had not expected, and now I had to sort of figure out over the board what to do. Which wasn't, I wasn't too desperate about it, because I had not expected it for a reason. I just not a very regular 1d4 player. And I was thinking about what sharp line I should get where I could maybe have a knowledge advantage against him. And in the end I thought I might have a decent chance to get the game. So I went for another Usually I play a bunch of Slavs or d5, e6 business as well. But I went knight f6, intending to play c4, e6. He played knight f3, d5, c4, e6. Here, of course, white can play the Catalan. But knight just played knight c3, and we got the Vienna on board. And yeah, even though I hadn't prepared it for that very game, I still, I've looked at a lot of Viennas throughout my life, and I've done a video series for good old chess 24 with my Vienna repertoire. So I felt if this comes as a bit of a surprise at least, I might have a knowledge advantage. Which is what happened, I believe, but I'm not sure how much that knowledge advantage helped me. And we play one of the main lines, e4, bishop, b4. Here, nowadays most people play bishop takes c4, but bishop g5, of course the alternative. Once again, I had to decide. I knew quite a bit about this move, h6 here. As Caruana used to play, I knew that Duda had recently done well with b5, a4, c5. And then I decided, nah, you know what, my lines are fine. I'll just stick to my repertoire and go for the direct c5, which I had given in the video series. Bishop c4, cd, knight d4. This was all played relatively quickly. Takes, takes, queen a5. This is where theory typically begins with white, mostly playing bishop b5 check sometimes knight b5, and sometimes the move played in the game, bishop takes f6. I was a bit confused after bishop f6, because normally when this happens, black, white frankly plays it to make a forced draw. Queen takes c3, <clears throat> king f1. Here, as kids were always taught, this is a mistake, it's not so clear, but after queen c4, king g1, due to the threat of rook to c1, and things are not so easy for black. You are not winning any material. Therefore, the best move is supposed to be gf6. And the line that is often played, not saying this clearly wasn't Nigel's intention, but that is often played when you get this, is something like this, which I was trying to figure out the details how this goes, but I knew this was sort of a forced draw. Um, I think this is the typical quote-unquote game you get with this bishop takes f6 move. But clearly not my opponent's intentions. He played g3 here, which I did not know very much about. I vaguely recalled that Magnus had played this in a game against Morozevic and that I had looked at it and concluded it was nothing. I also think I recalled, or I was sure Morozevic had castle in that game and I I believe I also looked at this for my video series and had given castles as the best move. I thought, yeah, the evaluation was 0, 0, 0. So I thought for a bit here and over the board, I can't really explain why, because castle is a very natural move, especially now that white has played g3. Because typically in these lines, or in similar lines, white goes h4, rook h3, when castles can be a little more troublesome because a rook might come here. But after g3, with this not happening, castles really is by far more natural than putting your king on e7. <coughs> and I was aware of all that. I can't really explain why I went for the move king e7. I think it was mainly some weird optimism that I'm gonna pin him with rook d8 and with my king on e7 he can't unpin by giving a check, which does not make a whole lot of sense. But I think that was my train of thought mainly when going for king e7 and not short castles which I knew to be the correct move. Just something I don't do very often, and I guess one should not do 
with very, without very good reason. But then again, what's also dangerous is if you haven't looked at a position for a long time and you vaguely recall, I think I was supposed to castle, you don't know the details. It can also lead to bad decisions. So it's good to try to find the right balance there between thinking about the position over the board and accessing your knowledge. And yeah, easier said than done. Anyway, my hand combined with a bit of my brain, but mainly my hand decided on the move king to e7 here. Objectively, short castle should be a bad move. King e7, king g2, rook d8 with my lethal pin. The problem is this pin, and I sort of saw that, doesn't really threaten anything. Like if he goes rook to e1 here, which I was expecting, e5 is not really a threat because queen h5, white just wins. So after rook e1, I did not have any Thing better or I thought than going knight c6 he can take take queen f3 whatever we get some typical position for these lines which I think black should hold it's not too bad but it doesn't give you a whole lot of upside to start with king e7 followed by rook to d8 another option was after rook e1 knight c6 to go for this peace sacrifice now with knight f5 check also very interesting and maybe there was something to be said, I think Nigel mentioned it after the game, for going king f8 here. But then, once again, it does not make a whole lot of sense to not castle, but instead play king e7, rook d8, king f8. Still, maybe this is what I should have done after rook to e1. He didn't give me a chance, he played knight f5 check directly. Which I had not considered as the main move, but I had seen that option. Knight f5, ef, queen h5, rook f8. And I wasn't sure that it was very dangerous, which actually it is, so I was wrong about that. But um, it did not make me all that miserable when it happened. I thought, okay, good, now we're playing for three results and I might also win this game. I might also get checkmated, so pros and cons. But I could not see a direct win and I was not too pessimistic here. What I missed is the move bishop takes f7 here. Or not so much the move itself, but the assessment of the position. Bishop f7 was a very good move, which I really did not think about. I only thought about ef followed by rook e1 or rook e1 followed by ef, which we will see in the game. But this was a good move. Now I can't take because of rook c8 and I'm pinned down, so I would have to go here. Knight c6, bishop somewhere, bishop here. This is more or less forced, so I guess this would have happened. Takes king to d7. And the position doesn't look too bad. My king will find shelter here. But the problem is it's very hard to coordinate the pieces after, let's say, check followed by takes. And I haven't let the computer run here forever, but I think it was giving white pretty decent advantage if you let it run for a bit in some position like this. Which, yeah, is not too surprising because it takes so long to bring this a8 rook into play. <clears throat> Not kicking myself or Nigel for not having gone for that because this is sort of a weird position to assess from far away <coughs> or for, for not having anticipated that I should say not having gone for it I didn't have that option but yeah this could have been very very dangerous and I was during the game I was not aware of that danger at all it was only after the game when I switched on my computer and said bishop f7 it was interesting that, yeah, I started seeing that I might have dodged a bit of a bullet there. Anyway, he played rook to e1, which is also what I was mainly thinking about. And now it's my turn to miss an advantage, at least according to the computer. But it's something that, frankly, I didn't spend a single second on. The computer says the best black can do here is bishop d7, ef, king d8. And it says black is better. But I did not consider this possibility at all. And I'm also not sure if in practical terms black is so much better here after, let's say, rook ed1. It's based on some pretty strange moves like king c7, stepping into a discovered check. Not so sure I would have seen all that, even on a very good day. And the line I played is fine, so I don't blame myself for not going bishop d7, king d8. What I think, first of all, I had seen that it's okay, or at least I hadn't seen how he can checkmate me. And yeah, it's much more natural. I played knight to c6, just getting ready, you know, to block this check and not 
keeping this bishop flexible, which could go to d7 or to d8. He takes f, king d6. I got some applause after the game, or I was praised for playing the move king d6. Wow, he found it and that kind of stuff. But there's really no alternative, and that makes it easier to find moves here. Knight e5, f4, I'm not in time. King to d8, queen h6, I'm just losing because I can't defend this rook. That's the big difference between king d8 and king d6. I need to keep the rooks connected. So there's really no choice. Therefore, king d6 was fairly easy to make. Even if it was bad, I would have played it because there's no alternative. Queen h6 was played, bishop to d7. That's the alternative here. Oh, the difference here. I'm connecting my rooks. And I had seen queen f6, king c7, that my defenses should be fairly solid. Rook ad1 is, rook ad8 is coming. And I'd also seen the line in the game. Queen f4, knight e5, queen d4. I was not 100% sure here if I should play king e7 or king c7. But I'd seen I'm not losing directly after king e7. So I thought that was that. And then when we get the position, I spent a bit of time here trying to figure out if I can go to c7. In the end, decided I can't. And I think I was right. Like, okay, I'm not sure how many lines you guys want to see. But generally, this looks very scary. Because once again, my pieces become uncoordinated and calculated some stuff like this and decided no nope, not gonna be able to do it and therefore once again more or less by elimination I went for king to e7 here nothing else works I thought about all kinds of stuff but it's all bad so correct decision but once again not very difficult that was sort of the good thing for me that yeah excluding knight c6 None of my moves here are particularly difficult after he sacrificed the piece. Which, if you're a defender and you have like 15 options and there's one narrow path to equality, then that can be very tough to find. But if all your moves are more or less forced, then even I might make those moves. Um, not trying to be fake humble here, I'm saying it's much, much easier if all other moves are obviously losing. So, king e7. Actually, I even got a little bit optimistic here because I was expecting the move f4. And I thought after rook fd8, I'm threatening bishop c6 check. It's gonna be wise just to be careful here. Because even if he just takes a clean piece back, I'm not material down. And my pieces will become very active here. I was calculating stuff like this. Queen d2. I think this is the line I was thinking about. Takes, takes, fe, fe. And. At the very least, only black can be better. Rook e5, king f6. I wasn't sure if it was much or anything. But I was quite confident that, yeah, I was out of trouble there. The computer, I believe, says queen e3 is better. But my assessment overall was right that only black can be better here. So I was even getting a bit optimistic. But then Sharp played a much stronger move. He played the move bishop to d5 here. When, yeah, with different perceptions. Because he seemed to think that I was in trouble and by miracle found this move rook fd8. After which, yeah. Oh, but he didn't say by miracle, but I th it sounded like his perception was that white had an attack and black has to be very, very careful not to get checkmated. Well, I thought it's weird, I don't have anything that doesn't more than allowing the perpetual. And. I thought I could not really be worse, so it doesn't really matter. The truth is, in the middle, it's a 0-0 equal position. And who you think is better and why is sort of irrelevant. Um, so yeah, I don't have anything better than going for, allowing this perpetual. White is nothing better than going for this perpetual. And that's how the game ended. Any winning attempts were very flawed here. Bishop e6, rook c7, for example. Just loses, but it's not that hard to calculate. So yeah, interesting fight, mainly provoked by me being an idiot and going king to e7, like giving all these fighting options like knight f5 check. When short castles followed by bishop d7, knight c6. It's really fairly dry and safe equalizer. But okay, felt good to at least have calculated some lines correctly and also not to get checkmated in a miniature after 59 f5 check which would have been unpleasant. 
still, yeah, tough game, left both of us with 6 out of 7. And then pairings, in hindsight, turned out pretty well for me. I got white against the surprise man of the tournament, Mr. Wong from Vietnam, while Nigel faced and deep Sengupta, strong Indian Grandmaster with the black pieces. And yeah, my game went well. My opponent, do we have picks? This is not it, here we are. <clears throat> I was praised for my stare there, but it's mainly just trying to keep my eyes open. Um, my opponent was another, I could, I prepared a bit, I could see he's not very theoretical, but if you play d4, he would normally go for half classical stuff with knight of 6, e6, b6, or d5, some Queen's Indian, Queen's Gambit type positions. So I thought, especially the Queen's Indian stuff, I might make a little harder with one c4 reasoning that I had used before in the tournament as well. But this time it would pay off a little better against Mr. Duong. He went knight of 6, e6. Now the only reason to punish a Nemzo slash Queen's Indian player for the move order is the move 3e4, the so-called Mikenas attack. Hmm, is it Mikenas attack? I think it's so. Mikenas, whatever. d5, the main line. Here white is a choice between e5 and cd5, both interesting. I went cd, e, d, e5. And this position by far the main move is knight to e4, which I had I prepared this a bit for for this very game. Knight f3, bishop f5, and now yeah, d3 or d4 or bishop e2 are all interesting main moves. I'm not gonna tell you guys what I had intended because I might end up in this position very soon again. But it's an interesting position full of play and I was hoping that it would suit me and that I would have a knowledge advantage here. However, my opponent after a very brief thought, went knight f to d7, which is a move I had never seen. And it looks very wrong. The black pieces are so clumsy. So I wasn't too upset with myself that I hadn't looked at this move, because it doesn't look great. I went d4 after some thought, c5, knight f3, knight c6. And here I thought both bishop b5 and what I played, bishop g5, were tempting choices. In the end I decided on bishop g5, mainly because after bishop b5, a6, here I did not consider the double whammy to go bishop g5 now. Had I seen it here, I would have probably done it. But I only thought about bishop a4 here. Which also looks fine, frankly. But in the end, I prefer to bishop g5 to it. I thought black should go bishop e7 here. When I was going to take. And I was very happy with my position. The knight has to take. Now some developing move. Probably bishop b5. But also bishop e2. Why is better? But of course, nothing too bad has happened yet. Instead he played queen to a5. And here I had anticipated queen a5. I thought my position was great after bishop to e2. Which might have been a little optimistic actually. The computer says bishop e2 is not such a great move. Because after cd4, knight d4. Bishop b4. Black develops fairly quickly. And I also, I thought bishop b4 was absolutely the only move. And everything else looked horrible for black. Which I still think. So I was thrilled when bishop b4 did not appear over the board. I was going to play castles and black has a choice of what pawn he wants to go after. Why does great compensation and initiative any time? But it's one of these positions that I wasn't that happy about because there's no real structures, no patterns and the play becomes very free-flowing tactical which I was not too thrilled about because if things go out of hand a little bit you could lose. So my usual pessimism, why is a good position here? But I thought bishop b4 was the only move. And when he played knight to c5, I could barely believe my eyes because it just looks just looks lost for black. And it is, it's a bad move. Now the pieces can't develop. I was so happy I castled almost instantly without thinking about alternatives. Turns out that knight to b3 was even stronger than castles, which is not that far, hard to spot after knight b3, a, b just going after the spot. So had I thought, instead of just being overjoyed and blitz our castles, I might have spotted this knight b3. Still, castles is good. Um, the black position is just 
in dire straits now because he can't really complete development. He went bishop e6. Here I spend a long time looking for forced wins with knight cb5, with a3, with all kinds of things. Could not really find anything, even though all these moves are good. But I could not find a line that ended the game right there, right now. And then, in this desire to find something forcing, in this position I spotted this option to go knight e6. And somehow talked myself into it, even though it's philosophically a very weird move. I exchanged my all-powerful knight for this bad bishop on e6. And there was no particular need for it. It was more me going, I must find a forced win. And then I saw a forced line with knight e6 and I went for it. Which is not the ideal mindset. Because my position is so good here, I should, one should ask yourself more, what does black actually want to do? Do I play a3 or f4? Or does black develop? And there are no obvious answers to that. So any move like a3 or rook b1 or f4, just, you know, keeping the position and introducing some new threats like b4, I think would just make the black position collapse. Anyway, I, in my desire to find a forced win, went for knight takes e6, sort of giving him a chance to develop pieces by returning the pawn with knight e6. Even though in my defense, I had calculated this, and I think correctly, queen takes d5, threatens bishop c6. So black has no time to take here. Bishop b4, bishop e3, castles, bishop c6. So this is the line I was going for. Takes, takes, knight d5, threatening a check here. Rook e8, rook fc1. And I thought it's fairly hopeless for black. I'm a pawn up, I have a better structure, I can very easily improve my position by bringing my king well there's more targets in the black queen in the black camp on the queen side so my calculation wasn't bad it was just i could have settled i could have gone for a bit more here but if you see the move 96 and you see the engine bar drops from whatever plus three to plus one don't be too harsh on me because it's a reasonably decent human solution my opponent went f takes e6 which, according to the computer, is worse, but it's a better fighting chance, so I'm not blaming him. I went queen h5, check g6, and here, remember I talked about this earlier, about blitzing out moves. I blitzed out another move, which I had calculated from afar, but still it was stupid to blitz it out. I blitzed out queen g4, when queen h3 was much stronger. And it's not that hard to spot either. You're just threatening bishop f6, you're hinting at knight takes d5. Mm, the position just collapses. So, but I blitzed out queen g4, which was my plan. I want to threaten b4, and I thought black had no real defense. But then after he played h5, I started somewhat kicking myself for having played so quickly, because I started realizing that instead queen h4 or queen h3, with this bishop f6 idea, were very, very strong as well. Anyway, h5, I went queen f4, and here I had spotted a nice trick, which I thought might happen. And fortunately for me, it did. He went knight d7, after which my combination occurred. Had he gone queen c7 here, I think the game was still far from over. The white position remains very good, but there's no instant tricks. And I might have gotten a bit into my own head about the game still going. I was looking for this forced win, I didn't find it yet. You know, that kind of stuff. So, this would have, at the very least, yeah, made me find a way to break through. I sound very fatalistic. The computer says rook 81 plus 2 or something. It's not a bad position. But the game would have continued. Well, after knight d7, at least psychologically, I had seen that I had this trick knight d5. I was very happy because I had not seen a defense for black. e d e6, just breaks through, threatening checkmate. There's nothing black can do. So he has to take, and the point is knight f6 check, which he also has to take. King d8, rook a d1, I thought was hopeless. Takes, queen takes, and now finally it's time to cash in, because material is gonna fall. This rook is hanging, this pawn is hanging, this pawn is hanging, and the tactical point is a queen e5. Runs into queen g6, king d7, bishop f6. Bishop f6 is not forced, and I had seen I can give a check, and 
give this check as well. Well, worst case scenario, I can just pick up that rook and win. So there's no defense after queen f6 and the game concluded. A couple moves later when, yeah, I had a lot of extra material. So that was nice and put me, I believe, into the sole lead again because Nigel lost his game against Sengupta. So I was the sole tournament leader and I would face Mr. Swapnil in the last round. Um, yeah, these situations there are sometimes where you can have a discussion about how to approach them, but I thought that one was pretty much a no-brainer. I thought that a draw would give me around a 90% chance, maybe even better, of winning the tournament. Because first of all, Sengupta would have to beat his opponent, an international master with the black pieces, which is not a given. And then he would also have to catch up one and a half points in Buchholz, which I thought was also serious odds to overcome because we shared some opponents and then to make up one and a half points. At least those are, those were the very inexact math that I did the night before. Seemed unlikely for me to happen and no one else had a chance to catch me in case of a draw. So my strategy was, first of all, play tight and then offer a draw pretty much early on because I didn't want to think about it like, oh, should I play safely or when should I get my draw offer in? So I just wanted to, yeah, blitz out some moves and offer a draw, clarify his intentions. If he takes it, fine. If he wants to play, also fine. And get this out of the way, out of the way very quickly. Which is what happened. I prepared a lot for that game. That game was at 9 a.m. in the morning. And, and I spent a lot of the night, actually, uh, brushing up my repertoire. Swapnail, he's a d4 player, but recently he had played mainly knight f3, d5, g3. So I had to decide what to do. I have two lines I can play here. One is knight f6, bishop g2, e6, castles, bishop e7, which I think I did a video series about on chess 24. For this game, I decided against it, because if you're in this draw mindset, he was normally playing the c4, b3, then these positions, it's easy to drift into somewhat passive stuff where you're either trying to force a draw and if it doesn't work you can be a little worse with this bishop or you try to avoid a clash by and keeping pieces on the board and yeah i wasn't comfortable with these situations anyway these lines are fine you can check my video series but for this game i decided against them also because i wanted to surprise him a little bit i thought that guy might actually check my recent publications. And I went for the other line that I'm familiar with here. I went for 2g6 and spent a lot of time, yeah, updating my knowledge on this stuff in the night before the game. One of this g6, bishop g7, I think was first brought to the biggest stage when Vichy played against Carlsen in their, was it the first or the second world championship match? I think their first. And one point is that if you castle now, black goes e5, occupies the center. Another point is that if white goes c4, black's idea is to take, and then often not to play knight f6, but instead to play e5, knight c6, knight g7, which is a very harmonious setup. And yeah, very, very reasonable for black. So, well, there's more theory to both of these moves, but most white players have concluded, as happens in the game, that their best bet is to play this d4, and after knight f6, castles, castles, we have transposed to some kind of symmetrical Grunfeld, but black is not committed to c6 yet. So after c4, which he played, which I consider the most critical move. There's other moves here. Kravnik has experimented with knight b2, bishop e3, bishop f4, c3, you name it. But none of those moves are very theoretical or very threatening. They just lead to sort of the game. Well, c4 is the main theoretical move. And here, well, I haven't played c6 yet. I could play c6, but that gives white a bunch of options, queen b3, c takes d, or b3. And I sort of wanted to, yeah, keep the mm, field of discussion a little smaller. So for this game I decided to go d takes c4, 
knight a3, that's the main line, and the move c5. Which is a safe choice, once again, assuming that a draw would give me tournament victory. If you're more ambitious here, then a line like c3, b takes c, c5 is more interesting. Because c, c5, frankly, is more or less an attempt to force a draw. Of course, white can um, make proceedings more interesting and then black might get winning chances, but in the main line after c5, which is d takes c5, mm, black is not really playing for more than a draw. There's other options here, knight c4, bishop e6 and so on, and as I mentioned, I spent quite a bit of the night brushing up on all these options. <clears throat> and yeah, well, the one big point is that d takes c c3, you shouldn't take, because after knight e4, black is better. But instead white goes knight to b5. This is a well-known line, there's a game. There's many games by now. Tremnik, Wei Yi. Black is nothing better than knight a6, cb. It helps white's developments too much. So you go knight a6, you go after this pawn, knight c3, knight c5. And we have a fairly symmetrical structure where white is a tiny initiative, thanks to the move bishop e3. Knight d4 also a move I checked in, in that very night because it was played by Ding against Kayaki. So, bishop e3 was played, and here I decided to execute my game plan. Go knight fe4 and offer a draw, which was accepted after some thought. As mentioned, yeah, I, I was well prepared here, and well, play typically continues. Takes, takes, bishop d4, takes, queen takes, queen takes, knight d4, knight d6. And I had spent a decent amount of time making sure that I knew how to play this endgame, which, if Black knows what he's doing, is very, very close to a draw. If anybody's better, it's white, because this is a bit of an entry square. But Black Black going rook d8, king f8, bishop out of the way, h5, a5, is not really in any trouble. Even though, yeah, you have to be somewhat precise with the move order and the different reactions to rook fc1, rook ac1, pawn to f4 and so on. And yeah, not the sexiest activity, but I was very confident that I knew what to do in that endgame. And I was very confident that a draw would give me tournament victory, even though I had to sweat it out. So I got this draw and then I saw immediately that Sengupta, after like 10 moves with black, was already much better, which wasn't ideal because it meant he would very likely and at least get to me on points, which is what happened. And yeah, I was a bit nervous that my Buchholz would be good enough. But in the end, long story short, I did have the better mm, Buchholz and I did win the tournament, which was nice. Here we see a picture of the price giving. <clears throat> That's me, in case you were wondering. And yeah, what can I say? I'm happy that I won pretty much the only tournament I play. Again, after all these years, I won it the first time I played it in 2011. Now again in 2019. Wasn't the strongest field they ever assembled there. And as you've seen, I got quite lucky in games number three and number five, especially. Um, but overall, what can I say? Just happy that I won a tournament at my ripe age and with my level of activity. Let's see <clears throat> if it will make me ramp up that activity, but I don't think so. It, it's not going to be a Godfather 3 situation where, just as I thought I was out, chess pulls me back in. Still, happy with that one. I hope you guys enjoyed this video, maybe learned a little something, or maybe not, I don't know. And I will see you the next time. I'm headed to the Granky Chess Classic soon, where I will be doing commentary on the Super Tournament featuring Magnus Carlsen, Fabiana Carana, Vichy Anand, Maxime Vashila Graf and many, many others. Ten in total. Should be exciting. The first meeting between Carana and Carlsen since the World Championship match. So yeah, check that out if you feel like. Thanks for watching.